gizmo on here. Okay. I uh, want to do something tonight, just something fun. Not, not necessarily quote unquote spiritual, just fun. I've got 12 riddles. Let's have the guys against the girls. It's going to be a challenge because I think we got more girls than we got guys here tonight. But uh, I've got 12 riddles that I found. And uh, some are easy, some are tough. Whoever gets the right answer, there, there's no prize. It's just the, the joy of beating the other side, okay? <laughs> and so the guys against the girls, if you have, any, have the answer, stand. And uh, Alex, could you do me a favor? Could you kind of f oversee and see who's the, the first, <laughs> the first person? You're up in the crow's nest, so uh, you, got a, you got a better shot at being able to see who stands up first. All right. We all set? Everybody's got to sit in. You all set? Did I get one? Hey, did I get one? No, you didn't. I don't think so. I don't see it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, first riddle. Why is the best baker most in want of bread? Why is the... Now you got to stand. She stood first, I think, right? Was she first? Okay, yes, ma'am. Because he what? Because he needs it most. Yes, because he needs it most. You are correct. So the girls get one point. Okay, did, did I have that in there? Okay. Thanks for being observant. Appreciate that. All right. Second one. Uh, let's see. If five cats... Catch five mice in five minutes. How long will it take one cat to catch a mouse? One no. One mouse. No. <laughs> what did you just say? Mouse. One mouse? Okay, how long does it take? Yes. Five minutes. Five minutes, correct. Guys, let's get going for crying out loud. Girls are Beaten you to death. Come on. Uh, part of the reason why I did this was because I knew that the uh, Freedom Kids would be in here. I figured they'd get it before anybody else. But Okay, before Mount Everest was discovered, what was the highest mountain on earth? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Mount Everest was the highest before, and it was the highest after. All right, uh, let's see, next one. The more you take, the more you leave behind. What am I? The more you take, the more you leave behind. Yeah, yes, ma'am. A what? An eraser? No. Nope. Not true. What? No. It could be, but yeah, kind of sketchy. This one is obvious. When you hear it, you'll say yes. Yes. Nope. No, you can't do it twice. Footprints. Footprints. The more you take, the more you leave behind. Footprints. Ah, uh, now this one's tough. I'm just going to tell you, I don't, I don't know I could get this one. This is tough, so think about it, all right? What eight-letter word can have a letter taken away and, and it still makes a word? Take another letter away and it still makes a word. Keep on doing that until you have one letter left that is a word. What? is the word. This is tough. This is really hard. Okay, what eight-letter word? It's got to be an eight-letter word. I'll give you a clue. It starts with the, with the letter S, and it ends with the letter G, and it's eight letters. Yes? Something? No. I can't hear you. No, he's wrong. <laughs> 
Hey, it doesn't make any difference. You're wrong. <laughs> okay. Anyone? Anybody? Okay. It's the word starting. Starting. Remove the middle T and you have starring. Remove the A and you get string. Remove the R, then you have sting. Remove the T and you get sing. Remove the G and you get sin. Remove the S and you're left with in. Remove the N and you have I. Okay. What has a head, a tail, is brown and has no legs? Yes. A what? What, what kind of coin? A penny. Correct. A penny. That's the girls. Three to one. Come on, fellas. All right. Uh, let's see. David. Now, you've got to think this one through. It's not hard. David's father has three sons. Snap, crackle, and... Bang. No. Who was next? Who was next? You don't know? Who? Nick. David, you're correct. David. David had three sons, or David's father had three sons. So if David's father had three sons, then David's one of them. Uh, let's see. What eight-letter word? No, that's the wrong one. I just, I already did that. Um, yeah, starting, yes, you are correct. Can you name three consecutive days without using the words Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday? That looked like... Yesterday, today, tomorrow. Yes, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, correct. All right, all right, it's tied up, it's about time. Okay, let's see. Um, what belongs to you but is used more by others? Your name. Your name, that is correct. Another one for the girls. Okay, uh, I got a feeling you've heard that one before. <laughs> you were right up. Uh, I make two people out of one. What am I? Um, <laughs> no, no, well. <laughs> I told you ahead of time, this is not a spiritual lesson, okay? <laughs> You, you are, you, actually, I got to give it to him. I, I got to give it to him. All, all right. All right, made two people out of one. But it's not that kind of a question, okay? It's not a, it's not a God question, all right? Let me ask it again. Uh, I make two people out of one, what am I? No. You're talking about a cloner? Somebody. Yeah, but she. she he's, he's more correct because he, he said God made it. He said God made it. That's more correct in that, even in that illustration. A mirror, correct. You notice, I, I notice the girls that are shouting the, the loudest. Yeah! are the ones that never answer a question. How about you try one? Here, let's try one here. Uh, <laughs> well, let's see. Um, what is more useful when it is broken? That one's easy. Okay, I got to give it to you. It's true. 
And besides that, I used that as an illustration this last weekend in a message, and so I got to give it to him. A what? No, 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 I make two people out of one. What am I? Oh, I'm sorry. What is, yeah, I, what is more useful? I'm tired tonight. Forgive me, will you? <laughs> I did not sleep all last night. What, what is more useful when it is broken? What? No. No. Sit down. A glow stick. You're, you're right, but I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What is more useful when broken? An egg. An egg. Very good. <laughs> Gals are still ahead. Okay. Last question. I am white when I am dirty and black. Chalkboard, blackboard, correct. So we now have a tie. Thankfully, I've got more questions. Okay. I haven't previewed these, so this could be dangerous. Um, okay. I like this one. A doctor and a bus driver are both in love with the same woman an attractive girl named Sarah. The bus driver had to go on a long bus trip that would last a week. Before he left, he gave Sarah seven apples. Why? I think that, that was Mr. Bean, correct? Uh, no, totally an apple a day keeps the doctor away. The guys win, yes! Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's fun. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now that I got you awake, maybe you can pay attention to the Bible, right? Amen? All right, 1 Corinthians 4. We're going to read verses 9 through the end of the chapter. Let's all stand together. First Corinthians chapter four and verse, verse nine. Actually, we're just going to start with just verses nine through 13. Verse nine says, "For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are, ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and, and labor Working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Uh, Lord, we, we are so thankful to be able to be here on a, on a Wednesday night in the middle of the week to get something from your word, to spend some time in prayer we ask, God, that you would lead, guide, and direct in all things. May you be our teacher and our guide tonight. We pray, Father, that, that uh, we would get a blessing from your book. Help us uh, to, to see what a servant of Christ is supposed to be like in the passage that we're studying tonight. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We've been looking at... at, uh, at at uh, different uh, pictures of what a, uh, a servant of Christ is is to be like, and and the the, the first uh, uh, the first one that we looked at was uh, was last week, 
And we're going to, first two were, excuse me, the first one was last week. It was a steward. And uh, this week we're going to take a look at the next one, which is a spectacle. He says in verse, in verse 9, he says, For I think that, that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Understand that uh, of all the apostles, only one of them did not die a martyr's death. All the rest of them did. They were put to death for their faith. And the Apostle Paul is using one of the things you've got to understand when you come to this part of the, of, of the chapter. He's being somewhat sarcastic because the church at Corinth really thought they had it together, really thought that they, they, they really were spiritual, and they weren't. And he had to tell them that right in the very beginning of the book. He said, I, I'd like to speak to you as unto spiritual, but I can't. He says, you're carnal. You're carnal, and because you are carnal, uh, I, I have to, to speak to you in that manner. And in verse 9, it, it makes it very clear that to the world, uh, the apostles were nothing but a spectacle. The apostles were, were last in the world's eyes, but they weren't last. They were first in God's eyes, but they were last in the world's eyes. You go down to verse 10, it says, We are fools for Christ's sake. But ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Uh, ye are honorable, but we are despised. The apostles, uh, the, uh, the Corinthians were, were wise in their own eyes, but really weren't wise in the eyes of God. And they were wise in their own eyes, and they were wise in the world's eyes. The world looked to the church at Corinth as, as, in, a, in a favorable way. And they were trying, I, I've, I've watched this so many times uh, with folks that get saved and they put one foot in the world and they put another foot in the church and in the Bible and in the things of God and they try to live their life like that. You can't do that. And the reason why you can't do that is because they go in opposite directions and you do the splits uh, and you end up being a real mess. And that's what, that's what Corinth was doing. Um, the world's view of Paul and the world's view of the apostles was that Paul was a fool. Uh, he was foolish. And he, 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 made, he made this comment throughout Scripture and through the epistles that he wrote that he be, he's willing to be a fool for Jesus Christ. He was willing to look foolish to the world. The, the, to the world, the Corinthians looked wise. Uh, to the world... Paul looked weak, and physically he was. He really wasn't a strong physical specimen. In fact, uh, we've, we've read previously that he even said about his own speech that his speech was not real strong. His speech was weak. And then they, of course, as the world looked at Corinth, they, the world thought that Corinth was strong. And when the world looked at Paul, the world thought, uh, world actually did despise the Apostle Paul, and they honored uh, the Corinthians. And he's, he's using a little bit of sarcasm here to, to show the difference between the two. And, and when you're living for God and you're sold out for God, you are going to look like a fool. You are going to look weak. You are going to look despised to the world. When you're carnal, You'll look like you're wise, you'll look like you're strong, you'll look like you're honorable, but that's not the case in the sight of God. We're strong when we understand our own weaknesses. We're strong when we depend upon God and don't try to do things in our own strength. And though both of those things were uh, characteristics. They thought, the Corinthians thought they were strong. They were not strong at all spiritually. And uh, they, they did not recognize their own weaknesses, and they weren't depending upon God. They were depending on, upon man. When we seek God's honor rather than man's honor, then the world doesn't like that, and we become despised by the world. And, and men want us to seek their honor. But if you live for God, you don't do that. Look down at verse 11. Verse 11 says, Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and buffeted 
and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world and as the offscouring of all things unto this day. In, in, verse, uh, in verse 11, Paul says that he was hungry, thirsty, naked, and homeless. He was hungry, thirsty, naked, and homeless. But then he goes and he gives what his response to those things were. It says he was hungry, thirsty, naked, and had no home. But Paul's reaction was, down in, in, uh, in verse, verse, uh, verse 12, and he says, and labor working with their own hands. So his response to the needs was, okay, we've got to work. And he worked hard. And he worked hard with his hands. He says, listen, if I got, if I got a need, I don't go to others for my need. I go, to, I go to God for my needs, but I know that if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. That's found over in 2 Thessalonians. And, uh, and so he, he, he worked. Um, he refused to take money from the Corinthians uh, because uh, he wanted God to get the honor and he wanted God to get the glory. And, and uh, his response to suffering need was to work harder. Then, then you get down, you get on to verse 12. And in verse 12, it says, being reviled, we bless. So he was not only hungry, thirsty, naked, and homeless, but he was reviled. What does that mean? What does it mean to be reviled? Help me out. Anybody know? If you revile someone, what are you doing? Yes, Karen. Evil to him about them. You say that again? Okay. You speak evil about them. You mock them. You defame them. Okay. All those kind of things. And uh, what, was, what was his response? Look back at the verse. At verse, uh, verse 12. Being reviled, we Bless. And what Karen just said is that reviled means to speak evil of. You ever had anybody speak evil of you? Let me ask you something. What was your response? I, I, got, I got a great conviction getting this lesson ready. Uh, I really did. Um, Paul said, listen, when I'm reviled, I bless what does that mean? It doesn't mean one of these things, okay? <laughs> That's not what it means, all right? What, is, what does it mean when Paul said, said when, I, when someone reviles me, I bless? You don't revile back. You totally give them a blessing of encouraging them, of being nice to them. Okay. You don't, you don't revile back. That's absolutely number one. You don't give them what they gave you. And you, you give them a blessing or you say something kind to them or you respond. Uh, if you don't say, if you, you know, there, there, there is some truth in if you can't say something nice about someone, don't say anything at all. But you can always praise the Lord. Even when you can't say, if you can't say something good about them, then say something good about God. But he said, I bless rather than curse or revile in, in response. Jackie? The golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. Exactly. And even if they don't treat you the way that you, you think that they ought to treat you. And so... He said that with, when people revile, and believe me, you know, we, we say, when we think of revile, we think, well, probably gossiping about him. No, 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 no. We're talking about, these are people that wanted him dead. 
Okay, these are people that absolutely hated his guts. Now, regardless of what political position you're on, a good way to illustrate this is the way that, uh, that you see politically people treating President Trump, uh, former President Trump. Uh, I, I've never seen such hatred for a public figure like, like I've seen for him. But that's the kind of, of, of attitude and by the way, President Trump does not respond biblically, okay, to the, those things. Uh, but, but Paul did. He said rather than, than re, you know, reply was something that was equally as negative or even not as negative, but still negative. Instead, I said something positive. And again, if you can't say something positive about them, say something positive about God. And, uh, and either way, it's blessing. And then look down in verse, uh, look down in verse 12, the, the end of that verse. It says, uh, it says, being persecuted, we suffer it. He said, when I'm persecuted, I suffer it. What does that mean? This is, this is a little bit of old English there, so it's a little different than the way we speak today. Yes, sir, David. I, I, I think it, I think, and this is what I'm guessing here, but it's more to allow. Yes, it's exactly what it is. Because the other example in Scripture is suffer the little children to come unto me. It's not saying suffer the suffer right. because you're around children. Sometimes you do. Yeah. <laughs> And it, it doesn't mean for them to suffer by you beating them either, okay? No, but I've been around children where I suffered because of them. <laughs> yeah. Allow. Yeah. But it, mean, it means to allow. Okay, so what does that mean? If, if he's being persecuted, but he's allowing it, how does he allow it? What, what, what is it? How does he respond? Yes. Okay, kind of like, like what uh, uh, Jesus did on the cross, wouldn't it be? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Did, when, when Jesus went to the cross, did he go to the cross unjustly? Yes, yes or no? Yes. yes, okay. He went to the cross unjustly because he's God in the flesh. He never sinned. He never even thought about sinning, okay? But he went to the cross. When he went to the cross, how difficult was it for them to get him to get down on that cross? It wasn't difficult at all. He didn't fight them. He didn't wrestle them. He didn't give resistance. When they were ready to nail his right hand, he put his right hand down. When they were ready to nail his left hand, he put his left hand down. He didn't move it when they came down with the nail. Um, he, he didn't fight it. And that's what it's talking about. He's saying, listen, well, I, I didn't just allow it. I, I put up with it. I, I took it. Uh, I did not in any negative way respond to the persecution. And then you look at verse 13. It says, being defamed, we entreat. All right, so he was defamed. Now that word defamed... means slandered. Means to be slandered. Okay, how, how, did he, how did he take the slander? It says he entreated. His response was to entreat. He entreated. What does it mean to entreat? Well, it, it, it's, it, it could have two different meanings as far as how he enacted it. To entreat means to ask earnestly. Uh, he could have gone to the individual and entreated the individual. 
and said, this is, this is untrue. Would you please stop doing this? Um, you know, I just, just let you know that it's not a true thing. Or, and it could be both of these, but the other thing that, that it's refer, it could be referring to is prayer. In other words, he went to God and prayed for them. He made an earnest, he made an, uh, an earnest request from God uh, on their behalf. And again, it would be like Stephen or it would be like Jesus. When Stephen was stoned, he said, Father, forgive them. So it, it, would, be, it would be something along those lines. In each one of these cases, th this, uh, none of these are fleshly responses. None of them are fleshly responses. They're all spiritual responses. Uh, your, your tendency when you're, when you're suffering need by hunger and thirst and naked and homeless is to complain or go begging to someone else and ask for help. Instead, he just worked harder. Uh, when you're reviled, what's your tendency? To have an attitude, not appreciate it. Uh, go after them. Try to... Uh, try to uh, uh, show, uh, possibly show some disrespect for the individual. Uh, get angry. He didn't do any of that. He blessed him. Uh, when he was persecuted, again, what did he do? Did he resist? No. No, he didn't resist at all. He suffered it. He allowed it. And then last of all, when he was defamed, when he was slandered, he entreated. And I, I, I personally believe that that entreating was more on uh, going to God on behalf of the individual and, and just going to the Lord in prayer rather than trying to take things uh, into his own hands. So this is, this is Paul being a spectacle. These are the, the servants of Christ being a spectacle. If you're going to serve the Lord, not everyone's going to understand it. Those of you that got, got saved out of unsaved homes, unsaved families, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because all of a sudden, not only did you get saved, but you changed. You know, God changed some things in your life. And all of a sudden, your values started changing and your habits started changing. And all kinds of things began to change, and they saw that change, and it made them very uncomfortable. This is how the world responds to a dedicated servant of God. Uh, they, you know, they, they, they cause them to suffer need, they revile them, they persecute, and then they defame. And uh, the way you respond is of utmost importance. And that's, I believe that's the reason why Paul brought that out. Obviously, he brought it out because the Holy Spirit told him to. But that was his response. That was his reaction. Uh, and then the, the very last picture that we see is found in verses 14 down through the end of the chapter. This is the picture of a father. And, and the Apostle Paul was very much a father to the, to the Corinthian church. He, he founded that church. He led many of them to Christ. And uh, therefore, he was like a father to them. Look in verse 14. It says, it says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though I have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some are puffed up as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will. And will we'll know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? One of the things that's interesting about, about the Apostle Paul is that in, in this whole thing, he says he was like unto a father, but he never specifically called himself a father directly. The reason why that is, keep your finger here and go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 23, and look down in verse 9. Matthew 23, verse 9. The Lord Jesus is speaking. Uh, go with me. Let's start, let's start in verse 1 and just get the context. Then, then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not after their works, for they say and do not. In other words, they were hypocrites. They told the people to do things that they wouldn't, weren't willing to do themselves. Verse 4 for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And then verse 9, And call no man on earth, uh, no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Now that's not referring to the father-son relationship as you have in your family. That's talking about religiously. In other words, Apostle Paul never had them call him Father Paul. Oh, by the way, uh, they never called Peter Father Peter either. Okay? The Roman Catholic Church constantly calls their priest Father. I absolutely refuse to use that title when I'm talking to a Catholic priest. I never have. I never will. Why? Because the Scripture says you don't do that. All right? Uh, but, but what he's saying is he's saying I had a relationship with you like a father does to a son. In other words, he's saying, I care for you. He's saying, I love you. And his relationship to Corinth was as their father. And you see it in, in three different ways. First of all, verse 14 and 15, he's the one who started that church. He led many of them to Christ. He says in verse, in verse uh, uh, 14, he says, I, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So one way or the other, because of Paul's influence, many of them trusted Christ as Savior, whether it was directly or indirectly. And he's saying, because of that, he says, I'm the, I'm the one that God called to come here to start this church, and I, I care for you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not coming to you just wanting to, to beat on you. Uh, though, and, he, and I believe he's saying all this because 1 Corinthians is a rough book. It's rebuke after rebuke after rebuke, but it was all necessary. But he's letting them know right, right up front, listen, I love you folks. I've invested in you people. I'm, you, you are like sons and daughters to me, and I'm like a father. Then verses 16 and 17, he says, Wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord. Now, he wasn't his beloved son, again, physically, but he was spiritually. And it was be, whether or not he personally led him to Christ, we're not sure. But we do know this, that he put so much time and so much effort into uh, him and into his spiritual growth that he, he felt like a father to Timothy. And, uh, and he says in verse, verse 17, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. In other words, he's saying, I, you know, I, I have been your example. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, Be followers of me, even as I also am a follower of Christ. He's not saying, follow me blindly, no matter what I do. He's saying, as I follow Christ, you need to follow my example, and you need to follow Christ like I do. Um, you, and, and he has said this to them, 
I think more, more so because of their immaturity. They needed to follow somebody because they were carnal. They needed to follow someone because of their spiritual condition. And when someone is immature or a new babe in Christ, you immediately point them to someone who's living for God and say, and says, and say be like he is or be like she is as she follows Jesus Christ. And in the, in the Christian life, at first, you follow an example, and then eventually you become the example. Paul told Timothy, he said, listen, you followed me. He said, now you are a pattern. And he used that word pattern. What's a pattern? Well, it's something that you, that you follow. Uh, you see uh, a, a certain lifestyle, a certain attitude, a certain relationship, and you follow that lifestyle, attitude, and relationship. And that, that's what he was saying. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And then last of all, verse 18 through 20, he says, Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? And again, you know, he started out this chapter and he said, he said, is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. One of the ways that, that a spiritual leader is faithful is that when correction and discipline are necessary, he doesn't cower from it. He goes ahead and he enacts it. And he's about to do that. In, in chapter 5, uh, he, he goes to the heart of at least one of the matters that was going on within the church. And again, they thought they were spiritual in the way that they were handling it. They weren't spiritual at all. They were extremely carnal. They were handling it like the world hands, handles things. And he's about to rebuke them and be tough on them. But he's letting them know. He's saying, listen... If, if, if I come, I says, he says, I, I'd, I'd rather you take care of this matter yourself so that I don't have to come with a rod, but I can come in love and I can, I can, I can minister to you in, in a different way. I can minister to you in a, in a spirit of meekness. But uh, uh, in, in all three of these, these pictures, you've got a steward, you've got a spectacle, and a father in this, in this chapter, a steward is told to be faithful. A spectacle requires absolute humility. If you're going to be a servant of Christ, you got to be humble. Uh, as, as pride takes over, the servanthood diminishes. As humility kicks in uh, before God and before others, as humility kicks in, we become more of a servant. And then the father aspect means tenderness and care. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you have a father-like spirit toward those you're ministering to, you have a tender heart. You know, he, he, st he started this whole thing off uh, up in verse 14. He says, I write not these things to shame you. Now, honestly, they, they should have been ashamed of the things that he said because he pointed out some good, good things, some true things about them. But he says, I came, as I, I'm approaching you as my beloved sons, I warn you. You, you warn people you care for. Uh, he saw them heading for some real serious spiritual danger and he wanted them to avert that. All right, any thoughts, questions, observations, comments? on uh, not only this part of the chapter, but you could, you could go all the way back to, to verse 1. Any thoughts, questions, comments? Okay, get out your prayer list, if you would. And we're going we're gonna to spend some time in prayer tonight. We're going to ask you to find yourself a prayer partner and turn this into our prayer closet. We've got, got special meetings coming up. Um, may I encourage you to, from... Now until Sunday, prepare your heart for the meetings. The way you prepare. Hey, folks. Hey, folks back there in the back row. I'm, I'm talking, okay? Pay attention. Um, 
it's important that we prepare our hearts. What are you going to do specifically to prepare yourself for the meetings? And, and uh, uh, spend some time in prayer and ask God even tonight to prepare your heart for the meetings that we're going to have starting on Sunday and go, going through Wednesday. Then uh, continue to pray for Linda Cloud. She's, uh, my wife uh, texted her here just recently and has had some correspondence going back and forth. She's lost 95% of her hair, uh, but uh, now handling chemo fine. Uh, just pray for her for strength. She's back in the States. Uh, she, wants to, she wants to be over on the field, but, she, but she's not, obviously. She can't be right now. So be in prayer for her. And then uh, pray for Michelle Engelbert. Michelle Engelbert was a member of uh, First Bible Baptist Church years ago in Green Bay. She's married to, uh, to uh, Mark. Mark, thank you. I just went blank. Mark, Mark Engelbert, he's a pastor uh, just south of Green Bay, actually north of Green Bay in Door County. And uh, uh, she has uh, thyroid cancer. She's going to have surgery. Uh, be in prayer for her, if you would, as well. And then also pray for our kids going to camp. And then pray for our vacation Bible school, which will be coming up. Uh, also, too, pray for Eric Shipman. He's, he is out of the hospital. And last I knew, and I haven't heard anything today, but yesterday, uh, no, I'm sorry, two days ago, he was released. And uh, he was released on Monday. And uh, last I heard, he was doing much, much better. But he's really in rough physical shape. So just, just pray for Eric Shipman. Pray for him spiritually more than anything. He needs, he needs to get serious with God about some things. And uh, so, so be in prayer for him. All right. Find yourself a prayer partner. Let's turn this into our prayer closet. And then when you are done in prayer, quietly leave. You do your fellowship in out there or out in the big fellowship hall called the parking lot. Okay? All right, let's go to Lord in prayer.